Very good evening to all of you. Rama has actually put me in a very tight spot. She has said so many good things about you, and in terms of no negatives. Well, I know some negatives myself, but it makes it very difficult now to live up to the introduction that she has given you. Well, <clears throat> I'm happy to be here, incidentally. I've not been here for some years now, and so my memory goes back to those days when I uh, was a more frequent visitor here. So it's nice to see that these lectures have now become so popular, and uh, we're actually speaking to a very wide diversity of uh, people in the audience. So once again, that makes things a little difficult. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm, um, I'm doing something which is actually very difficult to do. So I'm trying to summarize in one hour, uh, which I presume is something like the time I have, uh, a broad picture of the history of science in uh, Europe and India. I, I, I pick Europe and India because I know very little about what happened in China, for example. And uh, I must say that I do that, but I'm not a historian, nor am I a philosopher. So I think that you should look at this as the reactions of one working scientist, the kind of debate that goes on in India. Somebody who is actually interested in trying to find out what has actually happened in the light of the debates that have taken place in India and are still actually taking place. Um, well, <clears throat> I call it um, great triumphs and false stories, which I think is a, a good indication of what's happening in India. <clears throat> you have a combination of uh, some information on the great things that happened here and a lot of talk and debate about things which didn't happen here. And I think somebody who has not looked at it usually gets confused. What is going on? Some people are saying Indian science, whatever there was of it, is really not useless, nothing of great value in science. But there are others at the other extreme who say, well, our ancients knew everything. They knew quantum mechanics and relativity. They flew planes and so on. Uh, it takes a little while to sort these things out. And uh, what I want to do is really to compare briefly, although I have too many slides, I, I probably cut down some of them as I go along. I have them in reserve, so to speak, about, um, about what's happened. What's happened in the world of science, so to speak, especially India and Europe, because we have had contacts with uh, Europe for quite some time. If you look at uh, anybody doing science, whether it's in India or in Europe or the United States or in Japan, China, the science we study now is more or less the same. And most of it came from the last few centuries. It has the same heroes, Newton, Descartes, if you take physics, for example, mathematics, Gauss, Laplace, Einstein, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, all names from there, that part of the world. There's hardly anything else. You may hear a few Greek names. You'll hear about Euclid, of course. If you're studying still, still it's called Euclid in geometry. Euclid, Pythagoras. I'll come back to Pythagoras in a minute. And um, Archimedes, maybe. A few names like that. One very interesting thing, which I want to come back to, is that these names that you hear are widely separated in time. Euclid, Pythagoras, all these people were before Christ, okay? Second century, third century, first century BC. Pythagoras was fifth, sixth. Then there's a gap. After Ptolemy, for the next 1,400, 500 years, you don't hear any European names. If you look at what was happening in the world as a whole at that time, if you look at what was happening in India, well, if you look at mathematics and astronomy, for example, all the names that you hear about Indians 
who contributed to mathematics and astronomy come from that same period. Aryabhata is about 500, Brahmagupta, Bhaskara, you know, Madhava, all of these people. All of them happened during those 1,500 years. Uh, in Europe, that's seen as the Dark Ages there. But in India, it was not the Dark Ages. That's really the point I want to make, basically. <coughs> and I want to say where there are false stories and where, in fact, something can be said with confidence about what was actually done in India today. So a quick uh, cartoon view of the Western picture is that science started in Greece. It uh, had a big decline in the Dark Ages, 3rd to 16th century. That was revolutionized in Europe beginning 16th century. And that revolution, that is real, has been so powerful, so influential, that all of us everywhere in the world study the same science from the same books almost, same names. So it is remarkable what has happened. Well, uh, uh, sorry, I missed one here. Yeah, that's right. Well, what happened in that Science Congress, it's, it's actually about the Science Congress. I take that because it was a very public thing, national thing, it was all in the newspapers. I had a session on the history of science, and a group of Sanskrit scholars invited various speakers, and you had uh, big reports in the newspapers about what was said at that meeting. Basically, the view in the newspapers was that everything that was said was wrong and false. Claims which are false. Let's look at those claims. The first one was about aircraft. Well, that's my own subject. And some students and colleagues of mine at the Institute of Science <coughs> have looked at in detail about what actually is claimed to have happened in these two books, which uh, you saw, I quickly went through them. The Bruhad Vimana Shastra and the Vaimanic Shastra. They quickly find out, found out that this Vaimanic Shastra was actually a very recent book, just about 100 years old. There was a serious scholar, he was a serious scholar, who wrote all this book. But it, takes, uh, it doesn't take too much effort to find out that this just couldn't have been true. And uh, here were there's, where there's uh, flying vehicles. They look more like missiles than aircraft, for example. I mean, you don't see any wings. And here are uh, dimensions. And uh, no weights anyway. But, um, well, that's a 100 feet diameter. That's a Sundara Vimana. Here is a Rukma Vimana. But the problem is that uh, the way that this is uh, discussed in the book is like this. Uh, well, the text mentions a dimension of 1,000 feet, whereas the diagram showed you 100 feet, which was roughly to scale. So, these, these, uh, these, these contradictions are there. Now, if uh, you believe that book, the thrust, you say it's a jet, incidentally. What is, what is powering it is a jet. But unfortunately, the sign for the jet's thrust is wrong. It's, it's uh, in the direction of the not in the direction of the uh, flight of the aircraft, but in the opposite. So it's actually going to make it crash if, if they really used it. And then, of course, there are these fantastic claims. Can't be right at all. If you convert those uh, yojanas per ghatika, it's about a Mach number of around 10. There's no way that anything like that could have been done with those vehicles. So this is a striking example of a false glorification of uh, non-existent ancient Indic technology. Well, there was also a claim about Pythagoras. A Sanskrit scholar there said, the theorem of Pythagoras was known to Indians before Pythagoras. And the newspapers came down heavily on that as well. But there, the picture is actually somewhat different. Because if you look at uh, Pythagoras, well, that's the theorem as it appears in the Euclid's book, Geometry. All of you will know about it. You will have uh, learned about it in school. Now, uh, the crazy thing about this is that this is the first time that it was actually stated that way and proved by his methods of axioms, first having axioms, uh, deductive proof. But in actual fact, uh, triplets had been used earlier. 
Pythagoras, who was a contemporary of Buddha, actually never wrote anything. He never wrote anything about anything, and certainly he did not write anything about uh, geometry. And it was the part of mathematics that he actually preferred to talk about. It was numbers and their relation to music. Okay. But otherwise, he was very highly regarded. He had a large bunch of students and disciples and so on. What we know about him is what his students wrote about him. He never actually wrote anything. And as the centuries passed, he became a miracle man. It was claimed that he could be at two different places at the same time, like Krishna, for example. He had a thigh made of gold. I don't know how he managed with a thigh of gold. <laughs> and in fact, the first reference to the theorem of Pythagoras is made by a Roman senator and consul, namely Cicero, about 50 years before Christ. During those few hundred years, there was a lot of talk but it has never been publicly mentioned at all. But still, the theorem got called the theorem of Pythagoras all over the world. Now, if you want to find out exactly what might have happened, I think the most uh, credible account, authentic account, is in an article on Pythagoras in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. What, uh, what we do know he is uh, actually, he believed in reincarnation, considered the fate of the soul after that. He was an expert on ritual, a vegetarian, and said all these numbers. It almost makes you feel as if he actually visited India. And there are lots of stories that he might have visited India. I'm not saying that he did. And uh, the view that comes out of it, there was a German scholar actually, in the 1970s, who wrote a book about Pythagoras, the law and the actual history. And he showed very convincingly that it's most unlikely that Pythagoras had anything to do with that theorem. It was attributed to him, as we attribute sometimes. Sometimes if you want to give it some authority, some sense of authority in India, so he said, Vasishta said this, or Vishwamitra said this. So it's something like that that was happening in Greece as well. I, I want to say that because false claims are not entirely limited to India. They have come even in the world. Uh, here is uh, the theorem as it uh, actually is known in India. And although there have been some debates about uh, the date of this book called the Silva Sutras, the Silva Sutras, perhaps I should first click that. Um, there are 10 of them, and one which is written by Baudhayana is now accepted by scholars in India as well as abroad. I'm saying this because I, don't, I want to tell you that this is not a right-wing uh, claim of all of these things. Uh, his date was 500 to 800, so he said definitely preceded Pythagoras. And this, this, this statement appears in his book, sorry. <clears throat> That's the Sanskrit up there. And it says, the areas of the squares produced separately by the length and breadth of a rectangle is not stated for a triangle, incidentally. Stated for a rectangle and the area the square produced by the diagonal. And it gives you some examples. There's no doubt that the first statement of the theorem and the demonstration of it, by, but not by Euclidist methods, but by arithmetical and algebraic methods, was actually made, at least as of now, that seems to be the earliest statement of that uh, theorem. Uh, well, my good friend, the late Fritz Stahl, is a great Sanskrit scholar, always calls this Baudhayana's theorem. Okay. I remember what Manjul Bhargava said in a delightful lecture he gave on uh, one of his visits. And he talked about the, um, what was it now? The, not the Virahanka. He talked about the Virahanka numbers, let's say. No one has Fibonacci numbers, huh? Amen, that's correct, yes. Called the Fibonacci numbers in India, he said. So that's, that's, that's the sort of thing that's happened here as well. Plastic surgery was another thing. And uh, the press dismissed this claim about plastic surgery as uh, invalid. But in fact, that's not so. And uh, how do we know that? We know that by the accounts in England. 
You will not find it out from books in India, but you will find it in the books in India. Uh, there is an account of how to make the plastic surgery of the nose in Susruta. And it is very detailed. It was called Nasa Sandhanam. And it is so detailed, I will just give you an English translation of what happened. This is the way it used to be done. A bit of the skin would, would be taken out, stuck there. Your nose, if it had not been properly cut off by whoever punished you for it, <laughs> would carefully be put back and uh, would be held there for some time. This is the translation of what Sushruta says. I just want to show it to you, uh, to tell you, give you an impression of the detail in which he told you what you should do. Shape and size of portion of nose to be covered, replicated by cut leaf, leaf used as a template, Fresh, etc., etc. Long. So it was very detailed. And it told you what you should do even after the wound. And you had a large number of buzzwords. We'll probably come to, uh, with them later on. There was this concept of a model surgeon. Well, look at the number of virtues you had to have. You had to be a master of principles. You had to have a deft hand, clean, few, brave, unperturbed, wise, assiduous, truthful. Very, very uh, demanding uh, qualifications. But people have known this for quite some time abroad. And uh, we are still doubting whether that was true or not. But anyway, Vijayastik, who is a scholar in England, uh, is a very interesting comment he makes here that it seem to represent the interests and values of a section of Indian society that was Sanskritic and yet free from orthodox Brahmin values. Okay. It was in fact therefore a contribution from many different kinds of Indians. So, you know this from the accounts that were sent to Britain. See at that time, Britain was still thinking, now that's about close to 1800, 1790, 1800, Still think there were things that could be possibly learned from India. And the East India Company had people, who actually if they found anything that they didn't know about in England, had reports, the reports were sent to the Royal Society, the Secretary of the Royal Society. And those reports are there and you can read them. And I've just picked up some of them. Uh, look, at, look at this, this is an important statement here. This is one of the comments made by Dr. Scott, he was actually a medical doctor. He says, the big problem is, they never communicate by writing or printing, nor is their experience reduced to general loss like theory. Okay. He put his finger on a real weakness of the Indian approach to science. And uh, that's something that we must actually uh, admit. And the difficulty of getting information is again increased. But I can't do that for medicine, he says, but I can do that for surgery. Because the people are there. You can go watch it and you can see what they're doing. And there were four people who were, uh, you know, that was the time of the Anglo Mysore Wars, Tipu Sultan here. Four Marathas whom Tipu had punished by cutting their noses off. And they, they, all the noses were repaired in Pune. They were taken to Pune to Avaidya and he put them back. And these British soldiers were looking at it with amazement. And it made the headlines in the press in Britain. And. Um, well, here is, uh, here is what appeared, uh, you know. So two English doctors who were with the company watched the operation. And an illustrated account appeared in the gentleman's magazine. The account concluded by saying this. The operation is always successful. And the nose looks nearly as well as the natural nose. The scar on the forehead is not very observable after a long time. So this was, this was actually an eyewitness account from a very qualified person. So there was no doubt that that, that was being actually done in India. Here is one whose thing is described in great detail. He's probably, I think, the most famous bullock driver in the world. He was, he was one of those people who had lost his nose. His pictures appeared in uh, British magazines. Well, let me come to mathematics now. Uh, because that's where I think there's been in some sense interaction 
And it's very interesting to say, to speculate, or to assert, that there is a certain complementarity between the views taken of mathematics in England and in Greece or in Europe. In Greece, it was geometry dominated. In India, it was number dominated. And these were sort of complementary views. And I want to show you how actually this uh, took place. In this question, many of you will have heard of this question, which uh, Joseph Needham asked several times. He studied the science and technology of uh, China, in ancient China, in great detail. So it is a whole shelf full of books on it. And as he was doing it, he also wrote other articles and gave other talks and so on. And he asked himself, how is it? There are two parts to the question he asked. Why is it that India and China fail to give rise to distinctively modern science? Well, that is true. You must admit that that's true. Modern science did not come here. While he admits this, while they were ahead of Europe for 40 previous centuries. That is actually quite clear. Even if you see simple histories of mathematics in India at that time, it's very hard for you to find a name in Europe, from Europe, between Ptolemy and, let's say, Newton, Galileo, Kepler and so on. Very hard. On the other hand, in India, plenty of names. The ones as I already mentioned. And he asked, why did it come to birth in Pisa, but not in Patna or in Peking? Patna is the, well, that's, that's near where the Nalanda University was. Now, this is really, this is really, I think, the situation. Hellenic science declined after about 500 years. After Ptolemy, well, there was Diophantus, really, but that's about the only name that one can think of. Now, what about India? Well, different kinds of science flourished at different dates. If you take a look at Ayurveda, then that's, uh, well, from about 500 to 800, you could say. Not much happened after 800. Ajabata to Nilakanta, about 500 to 1,500, about 1,000 years. So, I think the Indian Dark Ages, the Indian Dark Ages are the last few centuries, actually, I think you can say that it's about uh, from the 16th century, 17th century. You can't think of an Indian name, big name, till about 1900. So those, those, those few centuries, those three centuries, where this was being built up in Europe, but really our dark ages, there was, there was no, nobody who would really claim to have contributed something great to mathematics. In Europe, I have told you about the Dark Ages and what all these people did. Copernicus said, no, it can't be geocentric. Galileo said, the church can't be right, you know, when he was asked about these things. <laughs> so, and uh, that was the period of the Reformation and so on. Something was churning in Europe. Bacon talked about new epistemology. Bacon, I'll come to Bacon in a few minutes, uh, is actually a key figure in what happened in Europe. Descartes introduced algebra to Europe, Western Europe, actually. And maybe I come back to him too. I have very interesting stories about him. And it was Newton who really made the big difference. In some sense, followed parts of Bacon's philosophy. And in another sense, it was the, it was the time when algebra was growing in, uh, in Britain and in Europe. And although he was as good in algebra as good in geometry, if anybody has read Newton's Principia, you see that the first two books are not algebraic at all. They're actually all geometry. They, they look like Euclid, complicated figures, convoluted arguments, and so on. And uh, F equals MA was not written down by Newton because he thought geometry was more dignified than algebra. And that was because algebra came from abroad. That itself says it. Uh, the word, for example, is not, no, has no Latin or Greek root. Descartes went so far as to say that it was a barbarous subject, although he himself introduced it into Europe. And there was another great scholar who said it is vulgar because it did not really come from, did not have a pedigree. So it was clear that it went from outside to Europe. There is no doubt about it at all. 
the algebraization became mature only with uh, Euler, actually. F equals MA is Euler, not Newton. Well, what were the things that the Indians did? I won't be able to go into any of this in detail. First of all, the numeral system. Now, actually, the numeral system had till now been dated to about the 6th or 7th century. If you read Aryabhata, which was around 500, 499 is when he wrote the Aryabhata. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't actually, you don't see the, these numerals because it's all in verse. However, if you see how, the way that he actually talks about those numbers, you can see that uh, it is really a decimal place value system, but a very strange one, an ingenious one. i come to that in a moment. So I think, uh, I think there was a real computational and algoristic revolution in India. Ayabata did very clever trigonometry. Numeral system, we have heard stories about it. Algebra went from here through the Arabs to Europe. Equations, Brahmagupta wrote down equations and many of them were written down later on. Combinatorial formulas, interpolation formulas, which were done, well, this interpolation formula due to Brahmagupta is about a thousand years before Newton. Uh, Newton Sterling was known to him. The Fibonacci, yeah, the Hemchandra numbers, that's the name I was looking for. Uh, that's what uh, Munjul Bhagava called them. Differentials, maxima functions, infinite series, and certain kind of calculus, they were all there. I heard of where they were in Europe. Now this once again can't be questioned. Because uh, although the first time that uh, one of the company officers discovered that there was something like calculus in the book. He assumed that it had come from Europe. But later research has shown, uh, because there was, a, there was a lineage of, there was, a, there was an intellectual uh, parampara, we call it. There was an intellectual lineage which actually did that kind of calculus. <clears throat> they were all part of one package in India. Numerals, equations, computation, algebra, calculus, analysis, equations. All part of Ganita. Uh, in Europe, that was still not the case. <clears throat> well, I don't think I will go through that. Here. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to tell you what I intended to tell you. <laughs> Namely, about the numeral system. Now, I don't know if uh, you saw the newspaper report a few weeks ago, which said something about the Bakshali manuscript. The Bakshali manuscript is actually a very interesting manuscript. You can now and you have books on it, where every leaf there is reproduced. And a great German, a Japanese scholar, finally said after looking at it, it's 8th century. It's about the 8th century, 7th, 8th century. But uh, now, the only manuscript, Bakrali manuscript, that original Bakrali manuscript is in Oxford. They've carbon dated it. And now they say it was the 2nd or 3rd century. Now, Indian scholars have always maintained it must be the 2nd or 3rd century, not based on carbon dating but based on its Sanskrit and what it's talking about. So it looks as if now the date of uh, the, date of the Bakshali manuscript of the second or third century is confirmed. And that uses, that uses actually uh, the Indian numerals as we now know them today. <coughs> so that probably is actually correct. Okay. <coughs> well, I think I'll skip this. Uh, here is one painting, the uh, graphic thing, uh, which uh, is something which is celebrating the victory of the new numeral system in Europe. You see, this is, uh, this is the goddess of arithmetic. Okay? You can see here, arithmetic A, see, that banner. And she is looking at these two. This man doing numbers, and you can actually begin to recognize the digits here. He's making calculations, fractions, calculations, numbers. Here is the abacus. So there was a long uh, dispute there between the abacus and the algorithm. And this is uh, an indication of when the algorithm won after several centuries, because uh, this goddess of arithmetic is smiling on this person. So that was about uh, 
1500. Well, uh, I have to say something about Aryabhata science. Um, I don't know how many of you know about Aryabhata's trigonometry. Believe it or not, this is a sign table. This is one verse in the Aryabhata here. And it's a table of signs. Now, how do you make a table in poetry? Well, that comes because uh, he had an ingenious scheme for denoting numbers. And if you read this or the rest of the book, uh, the impression I get, this is my personal reaction when I first I went through the original. You quickly see that he is very clever, ingenious. But he is also playful. He stirs. In fact, it is not easy to understand him unless you have a translation or a commentary. Deep, unfussy, business-like. And um, that's it in Sanskrit. And this is in Roman. When you first read that first line, Maki bhaki paki dhaki dhaki. What's going on? It looks like drums. <laughs> <coughs> you know, these strange sounds, he's probably composing it to some, somebody who's playing on the drums. But each one of them is actually the value of a sign. The only real Sanskrit here is the very last part, Kalardha Jaha. They're actually the first differences of the signs, or the half cards. Okay. He's not giving you the signs themselves, but the differences. Because the different four digit difference would give you a five digit accuracy in the, in the sign. So it, it makes it a little easier for him. This is the number values. He takes the Sanskrit alphabet and gives every letter a value. K is one, K and so on. According to these Vaga consonants, it goes up to 25. And then the unclassified consonants go from 30 to 100. The vowels are powers of 100. You start from 100 to 0. To 100 to 8, 10 to the power 16. Okay. So you have all of that. And uh, the table you saw is uh, really syllables which give numbers according to this system. What is this number in uh, Aryabhata's notation? Well, I, I just cooked it up. Kaki, kuk, kru, kru, etc. You understand all of them. And in English, you would call, you'd have to say, 10 quadrillion, 101 trillion, 10 billion, 101 million, 10,101. Okay, that's what it is. <laughs> How big is cow? Cow, in Aryabhata's thing, is 10 quadrillion, 10 to the 6. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's a very, it's a, you can see what an ingenious system it is. Large numbers, Indians love large numbers, incidentally. And there are those differences. Well, you can go through the modern values and Aryabhata's values. They're actually very close. There's only one or two places where the last digit differs by one. Well, people did other things too. By, uh, you know, doing a series. This actually amounts to using, you start with two numbers in the table of signs. Let's say the first and second, or the zeroth and the first. And then the successive values are obtained by looking at a formula like this. Well, that's really integrating. But there's a finite difference integral of the second order equation which governs the sign of the trigonometry. Okay? And uh, this is written by differences. Indians didn't, have, didn't write the differential equation, but they knew that the differences followed this rule. And so he said, you only have to remember two numbers. Then you can work it out. You didn't have to go back to Aryabhata. So that's what it was. Well, um, I don't know whether I should really go through this. Let's just uh, quickly go ahead. That is the same story about interpolation. Well, you already saw. Um, Aryabhata had only differences, so you could interpolate. And uh, Brahmagupta had an interpolation formula, which is, uh, which would be written this way, what he did, which if written in modern notation would be this, which is the Newton-Sterling formula. Okay. And appears in Newton's book there. So there are many things like that. 
And then about algebra, well, I spent a little time with algebra. He, was, he, was, he made great contributions to a whole variety of subjects in mathematics. Arithmetic, algebra, trigonometry, calculus, and even engineering. He was the first man to propose a perpetual motion machine, believe it or not. Of course, we now know that it wouldn't work, but he actually cooked up one, which he said should run by itself forever. Uh, so he, he actually was a man with a very wide range of interests. There's an invocation, which is an interesting pun. Depending on your taste, you can either read it as a praise for numbers, which of course was, it was his love. You can also think of it as a praise for Sankhya philosophers. And I come to Sankhya philosophy in a minute, because Sankhya philosophy really was sort of non-theist. And I tell you about them, what they proposed. Or, if you were a theist, you could also be interpreted as a song in praise of Ishvara. Okay. So it did, it did all three things. And the big thing that uh, um, Bhaskara said in defense of algebra, Bija Ganita, why are you doing Bija Ganita? It's great clarity, he said. I remember what Haldane said about an ounce of algebra is about a ton of argument. <laughs> it was the same idea. And if you, if you look at, uh, if you look at Bhaskara, he's always telling you, you know, about this is, this is sputa. Sputa, spashta is clear. There's a common word used in uh, Kannada too. Sputa, of course, is explosive. It is brilliantly clear. If he, if he gets a good result, and it's brilliantly clear that it is right, he says, it's sputa now. It has great power in looking at unknown variables, avyakta, unexpressed variables. And it's a source of joy to Ganakas, mathematicians. Uh, because if you have got a formula, you've got a formula for something which is actually complicated and it works. And the power is that it is very clear. Well, so I think I've told you about this. There were, in fact, solutions of equations as well. And we, there was even a notation for writing those equations. I won't uh, go through the arguments at all, but it may be interesting to, yeah, and as you said, the first proposal made for a perpetual motion machine. Here was the way, the way, the way that equations were written down in India. If you look at the top, let's say you take that equation, as you would use it today, the way that it would have been written in India, one of the ways, there are more than one, but I'll talk only about one, is this. The left-hand side is there, and the right-hand side is below. And uh, uh, the convention is the first line is equal to the second line. There's no particular sign for uh, equality in this, in this case. Ya is yavat tavat. Well, whatever variable it may be, is unknown. Ya is the analog of x in uh, algebra today. Ya is unknown. Y is square, is varga, times a. So this is ax square. This is bx, similarly. And this is the form of C plus C, which is just a number. It doesn't have all of it. So A, y squared, y times A, v times A, y times V plus C. And this is similarly D squared, DX squared, E, X, and F. They're equal. So if you had zeros, this is where you would split it. You would write zeros in the line lower down, because there are no X and Y terms in the second equation. So this was uh, quite widely used, but there were other systems as well. Here is an x square minus y squared equals 36. And you will by now know that this is the way it will be written in India. This is an example taken from Kaori's book. So, this is the way it was written in medieval Europe. Well, this is very clear. This is very clear. It's easy to get used to it. This is very difficult, actually. That was, that was the notation used in medieval Europe. Kerala mathematics. Well, I think that uh, a great deal can be said about this. Uh, once again, surprising, but I don't think there's any doubt that these things were done here. Um, you see, in India, there was no problem thinking of an infinite series. 
whereas it presented uh, serious, serious philosophical problems in Europe. Uh, well, the Greeks had always trouble with both zero and infinity. The nature of both vacuum, said uh, Aristotle. And uh, the world was finite. The universe for the Greeks was finite. For Indians, it was not difficult to say, that, well, the universe is infinite. And use zero without any difficulties about it. So once again, you, you can see the wide difference between the approaches between the two countries. Um, so there were, there were expressions for infinite series. The thing goes on and on and on. All the trigonometric functions, well, many of the trigonometric functions, the things were discovered here. Sin x, cosine x, arc tan x. You see, of course, I have written them in modern notation. Uh, these appear in uh, various books in the Kerala school. And they reappear in England, uh, some of these. Well, this, this was actually, this was always been credited to Gregory. And, uh, uh, and the series that uh, are named after Maclaurin, Taylor series, Maclaurin series, they were actually all known and written down. So it was, uh, trigonometry was algebraized in India long before the 14th century. But this uh, took time in uh, Europe. I just say a few words about it and we'll go to conclusion. How much time do I have? 15 minutes? Okay. <clears throat> now, there's this the big thing about whether the Indians have a scientific temper. Jawaharlal Nehru was very worried about it and was a great advocate that we should instill scientific temper in everybody all across the country. And uh, when you heard this, you wonder whether Indians were ever rational about what they did or not. And, uh, well, I had that doubt uh, myself, and I assumed that in fact that was all something which came from Europe. But when you actually look at it more deeply, the picture is different. You must, of course, remember always that India is an extremely diverse country. There are all kinds of popular beliefs, and uh, there are all kinds of uh, philosophies. Indian philosophy is not one thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a collection of many different views. These views are not all in complete agreement with each other. And even if you like one school, you read all the other five schools too, all the five orthodox schools of philosophy in India. That's been, uh, that's been uh, practiced for a long time. Nilakanta, for example, was a philosopher as well. And apart from what he did in mathematics, he also got the title of being a Shaddarsana Parangata. A scholar in all the six systems of philosophy in India. If you ask him, what do you believe in yourself? You will find it out only when you look at his mathematics. And he makes some very interesting statements about it. So, Sushrita's buzzwords, well, I quickly flashed it, and I won't go through it in detail. Theory and practice, you must combine. They're the two wheels of a chariot, he says. Shastra and karma. You can't do only one. You must be multidisciplinary. You see, Nana Shastrartha. Now, this is all most probably BC, maybe a third century BC. Clean and heal procedure, the importance of exercise, and it goes on like that. That you already saw. Now, you go to Ayurveda, you look at Charaka's book, he says there are three kinds of medicine. Okay? One which relies on God, Daiva of your past life. The divine. Well, that is done through rituals, prayer, pilgrimage, etc. Another one, done through uh, the mind. Sattva vajaya. Mind, control of the mind and so on. But the one I do, he says, what one I do is based on yukti. And yukti is... Um, well, yukti really is a word uh, which has uh, uh, different meanings. It has, it has to do with skill. It has to do with reasoning. It has to do with inference from observation. You see, you shouldn't do it without observation. So, he says, uh, mind is yukti. I will tell you how you can treat some disease. I tell you about the diet, the medical drugs, the treatments, processes, and so on. He was not for 
either one of these other two alternatives. He doesn't criticize them. That is also there. But he says, <laughs> that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about how you actually do it through human means. Yukti is very important. You see, if you want to look at either the past or the present and the future, you have to have yukti, he says. Otherwise, your goals will not be achieved. The three goals that he mentions here are dharma, artha, and kama. Okay. None of those three goals. But he didn't include the fourth one. This is to do with liberation. But he wanted to do the other things that people want in the world. You have to have yukti. Well, success. Siddhi, success is, is founded on yukti. And he said, this is, this is a very interesting thing. He says, Sukham Samagram Vijnane Vimalesha Pratishthitam. All happiness is founded on spotless science. Okay. And this is the important thing that I want you to see. This is good. This goes back to Sushrutana, okay, long ago. And he says, very categorical statement. Even the Shrutis are no reason for a belief contradictory to Yukti. Yukti, therefore, was a central concept that the scientists pursued in India. Uh, when I was a kid, Yukti was a very common word used in Kannada. Now I see that it's virtually disappeared from our vocabulary. <laughs> but it meant being clever, ingenious, uh, reasoning. Don't do things without, uh, without thinking about it and so on. Uh, you observe. That was Yukti. But uh, Yukti here was a major scientific tool for studying nature. Shrutis don't stand in your way. So India would not produce a Galileo because in India you could question the Shrutis. But it's not done openly and in public. The scholars who wrote these books for each other, they said, well, not just one person, Charaka is one, but there are others too. Nirakanta said the same thing. So there's a gap of something like 1,500 years between them. That never changed during that whole 1,500 years. The, the philosophy of the practicing, the, the great practicing scientist, always said, Shruti, I mean, Shruti should not stand in your way if you have a certain conclusion that is certified by Yukti. Here, here is what Nilkanta is saying, you see. All this, all this that he has done is rooted in Yukti, not in Agama, he says. Aryabhata says something very similar. He says, all of this that I've given you in this book, at the end of the book, are gems that I've dredged, dredged from the vast ocean of truth and falsehood. On a boat, which is my mind, dredging it from there, from sailing on a boat, sailing that sea. And only my mind is given by Brahma, he says. But nothing else. He doesn't, he doesn't appeal to the Shrutis or scriptures at all. Well, Siddhantas were not universal in time. And uh, they could, in fact, they needed to be corrected every now and then. So knowledge was seen as tentative and uh, something which you have to keep improving all the time. And where does knowledge come from? It comes from two things. Uh, pariksha, which is observation. That's number one. Nilkata says, the first thing you have to do when you get new students is to teach them how to observe. They have to be very careful. They have to avoid errors. They have to know how to interpret what you get. First thing, therefore, is observation. The next thing is inference. From those observations, what kind of conclusions can you get? So that was first, and this was second. And they were, they were actually central to Indic scientific thinking. And when you use the word yukti, you in some sense mean this whole kind of thing, this kind of approach to generating knowledge. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, there was no, if you wanted to say in one word what the Indian philosophy was, I, I had to coin this word. I would say it's a kind of computational positivism. The proof 
The proof lies not in, not in a Euclid type argument or in a, uh, or a, uh, an Aristotle type argument. The proof lies in your calculation agreeing with observation. Observation is first. You look at the patterns, you look at the results, and then if you see if you can make an algorithm which will predict those results, which will agree with those results, then you have understood. So it's uh, it, it, it depended very largely on computation and observation. So that's that's the way that they looked at it. Discrepancies between observation and computation indicated the need to revise or tune it. They were not agents of philosophical crisis as you would have in the Greek approach to the subject. That was also well. That was also actually the view of uh, many other people. I think that uh, well, I'll skip this. And then the Sankhya, well, I think I'm running out of time. I only want to say here that uh, the Sankhya philosophers, you know, were uh, held in great, great regard by uh, many of our scientists. Success comes from inference, they say, knowledge of binding connection. Here is a very important thing. Namastu, namastu siddhi. You can't make material from nothing. There are all kinds of people who claim to do that, right? They produce something out, out of nowhere. And there are many holy men in India who will actually, you know, give you that. And there's a large following. But old Indian philosophy said that's not possible. The Sankhya said that can't be done. They had conservation of mass in mind. They didn't think it could be done. Well, uh, the European miracle started with bacon. But I don't think that um, I'm here to go through that. But uh, it's interesting to know that bacon, for bacon, he had his two equations. Knowledge is power. And truth is usefulness. And he thought Europe, particularly Britain, was in a very bad state. That uh, there's nothing interesting that's happened in Britain or in Europe for 1,500 years. And so he went out of his way to change it. And basically the way he changed it was partly along, along the lines that were being uh, used here. He said that syllogism must be rejected. Okay. He really uh, said that the axioms which the Greeks think the Greeks could pull out of nowhere. Can't be done that way. It has to come from step by step by observation. And you may have to keep changing them for a long time. And uh, he was dazzled, we were dazzled by these new technologies. And um, he, was, uh, he was very, he was very critical of the famous Greek names. In fact, he uses, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, what do you call it? He was, um, he used strong language. Aristotle was a quack, he said, composing a manual of madness that made us slaves of the world. Similarly, Plato. Now, you see, Plato, there's a good reason for him to say that. Because Bacon goes back now and says once again, you must now, you must make tests, you must make experiments. He even gives you a large series of experiments that people should make. Plato was a man who said that if you are sufficiently clever, you really didn't have to observe, believe it or not. So he said, a smart man, if you just put him in a room, then he will figure out all of astronomy. He doesn't have to, he doesn't have to actually watch. Why? Because you make the right kind of axioms, and then you will find but sooner or later, you have understood everything. Whereas in India, it was just the opposite. Observe was the first thing. And Bacon brought back observation to position number one. But then he didn't give up on the Greeks completely. He still was for axioms. But the axioms must come from observation. They're not on page one. They're at the end of the book. That's the way that he saw it. After you've observed, you deduce the axioms. And don't think they're universal axioms yet, because later on, things may change. But uh, Europe, the great strength of Europe, I, that's, what, that's what slide I'm looking for. The great strength of Europe, I think, 
was that they believed in universal loss, which Indians did not, especially physical loss. See, Indians were very good at numbers, and they did all those other things, you know, algebra, calculus, and so on. But is there something like, the, like Newton's laws? No, you find them very hard. And they did make physical, not arguments, but observations, but never thought, they, thought, they never thought of it as something which would explain the whole universe. They said that's unlikely, so they did not actually were searching for it at all. Here is what I think is a concise and, in my view, very precise summary of what has happened, what happened in Europe during those years. Uh, he said here, Oriental mathematics, this is Herman Bain, and it appears in his uh, famous book, the first one, I think, The Theory of Groups and Quantum Mechanics. Occidental mathematics has in past centuries broken away from the Greek view and followed a course which seems to have originated in India and was transmitted with additional stories by the Arabs. In it, the concept of number appears as logically prior to the concept of geometry. That, that tells you in one line what the big difference was between the Indian approach and the Greek approach. Well, that's probably a good place to stop and uh, just state some conclusions, which is really what I'll do now. Um, I, there were other things this year that I wanted to mention very quickly. At its root, European miracle, there, there's no question that there was a miracle, you know. And uh, what happened there was that these ideas had uh, trickled from the East, India and China, technologies from China. And despite Bacon's scathing ridicule, the ideas of the Greeks revived in the 19th century. But modern science has different streams, but has been dominated by this creative and extraordinarily powerful fusion that occurred 400 years ago in Europe. And that fusion, basically between algebra and geometry, has made a big difference and I think is uh, uh, behind the uh, great scientific discoveries that were made in the coming centuries. Maybe there's now only one global way emerging. Maybe there is not. But uh, these are what the Indians said. And uh, the things that happened. In summary, the Indian computational numerous revolution of the fifth century, Bacon's inferred axioms, and the Newtonian revolution of the 17th century, which has had a profound influence on science everywhere in the world. So I think the history of science and even of epistemology is actually checkered. If you want a definition of science, I don't think it should depend on what we are thinking now or what the Indians thought or what the Europeans thought. But I think it's, uh, if you define it as evidence plus reasoning and no subservience to authority, then I think it's actually quite old and probably came up in uh, several cultures, but they didn't last very long. So, the geography of science has always been speculated. It's not happened everywhere, all the time. So the brief history I want, the last line I want to leave with you is this. History is checkered. If you look at the globe at any time where things are happening, you will see only spots. There's a computer thing which I should have brought about the geography of science in the world now. And they erect polls on each country about how much is being done there. Well, it's true even today. There are only a few polls. And India is not one of them. And we must understand that. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, hello, sir. I have a question. Um, so, are these sciences still being transmitted orally or otherwise in India, like the Vedas, for example? Sorry, have, sorry, sorry. Are these traditional Indian Indic sciences, yeah. are they still being transmitted from one generation to the other, or, or have they all stopped at one point in time? Well, there are some scholars still in India left, and I think that the scholars pursue them. 
but it's not part of the curriculum in India. And uh, the Indian textbooks don't reflect any of this at all, uh, none. Although, of course, I know that you have to be very careful about you know, false stories. There are plenty of false stories circulating. But I think in the scholarly world, these are now accepted. And I, that's why I kept quoting Westerners. Because otherwise, you would think that I was a BJP man or somebody who is making these stories. They're not true. It is accepted by them. So, but even that, there is some hesitation in India to go ahead and say, you know, this formula was actually done by Marwa. Or this was done by Bhaskar. This algorithm came from somewhere. Now, that as, a, as an active field of science, it doesn't exist anymore. It died. It, uh, it's completely dead now. But it started dying after Nilakanta. So for the last 300 years or so. That's why I think of them as the dark ages in India. But uh, there are a small number of scholars who I think are still studying these things in detail. I won't be surprised if there are more scholars in the West than in India. Sir, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, when did Jyoti Shastra... Sorry? Uh, when did Jyoti Shastra erupted in India and uh, what is its relevance? Well, it is uh, thought that uh, astrology was actually one of the Greek inventions which the Indians borrowed from them. That, that, is, the, that is the accepted uh, view. I don't want you to take it as uh, the absolute truth because uh, these things we know, uh, you, know uh, you have to look at it very carefully before you can find it. There was in fact a Greek text which was translated into Sanskrit some centuries AD. Uh, but the books on astronomy that I mentioned, Aryabhata, Brahmagupta and so on, they don't talk about astrology at all. They're strictly about astronomy. Aryabhata doesn't even mention astrology. Nilakanta doesn't mention about astrology. Now, did he actually do astrology? He probably did. Why do I say that? Because, uh, you know, that's what they had to do for a living. They had to teach. And one of the things that uh, if you knew astronomy, and if you had some astrology that you wanted to do, I think they did it quite often for a living. My guess is they had no objection to somebody saying, I want astrology. But I think they always kept their astronomy separate from astrology. They made that distinction. None of these uh, texts, except uh, possibly Varaha Mehra, none of these texts really talk about astrology at all. Sir. Hello. Yes. Sir, uh, like how you give the Indic view of mathematics, like where uh, everything was uh, looked under one code name as Ganita. So what do you think? Do you think a system of knowledge, when it is made in, when it is distinctive parts, is the understanding better there, or is the understanding better when everything is assimilated so that you can see the connections between each other? I'm not sure I understood your question. You're talking about the two different ways. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, sir. I'm just saying. You're like, about the Indian uh, approach. Yes, sir. For example, in Indian approach, yeah. there are a lot of fund like applied numerical methods and different branches of mathematics. They were put under one term, like Ganita. Yeah. And they were, that body of system of knowledge was handled like that, understood yeah. in that way. Right. But now we have mathematics divided into many several subgroups. Yeah. Uh, is, so what do you say in your experience? Is the understanding better when you make it distinct? Or is the understanding better when distinct everything is coming? Uh, approaches, is it? Is yeah, distinct it? approaches. Well, I personally feel, uh, this is a view, I personally feel that uh, things will keep changing. See, for example, the position of uh, the kind of proof, please sit down. No, the, the position of the kind of proof that Euclid offered, axioms on page one, and then logical deductions, Aristotle's logic. You do that. Uh, we know now that, in fact, they are not all completely correct. There are other assumptions you would have to make if you really were very rigorous. But um, that kind of approach was one. But I think after Kurt Gödel, Gödel's theorem, and so on. And also the uh, big explosion that's occurring in computing, I think that there are now different kinds of things coming up. So I think that uh, my own feeling would be that uh, it will get a little more flexible this time. It will not be any one. You see now all this excitement about big data. Okay. Well, it's really a kind of uh, statistics on a mega scale. And uh, well, maybe that's the way it will go. Because computers become, uh, as, as computing becomes cheap, the one thing whose price is going down in this world is uh, the price to make a calculation. That's going down continuously for, for the last 50 years or so. 
and it seems to do that for some amount of time. So computing is becoming more and more relevant. When I first started, um, well, I first, when I first came across a computer, it was at Caltech actually. And even at Caltech there, uh, there was a small computer. But at that time, the computers were not really very big. They were a small computer. But it was not a big thing. And uh, the mathematicians were not for computing. They said, if all of you people start computing, analysis will die. That was the general uh, opinion of uh, mathematicians, <laughs> a few mathematicians. But what's happened is that in parallel, however, computing has developed enormously. And the computing has its mathematics of its own. My guess is that uh, it will, for some time at least, be more flexible. If you're doing research at a place like ICTS or JNC, you don't worry whether I should compute or not. If you think you get the answer quicker by computing, you compute. And uh, that doesn't mean that you don't make experiments. There are some cases where it's easier to make experiments than compute. But uh, we do experiments, we observe, we compute, we theorize, we analyze. So I think all of these will sort of be become a kind of diverse, diverse approach to knowledge of uh, nature and uh, development of technology. So, yes. Professor. There's like uh, three questions waiting ah. from upstairs, oh. and then a whole lot of questions here. Okay. okay. So one question says, a picture of Feynman flashed past on the slide. <laughs> Curious yeah. to know what it is. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I was running out of time, so I'm sorry that I had to skip those slides. Uh, there's been, actually, it's related to the question that uh, you asked. Is there only one way of doing science? The traditional Western view has been that, uh, well, the Greeks invented science. And uh, here was this method they laid out for you. Uh, it does use mathematics, but you had to have axioms. You see, if Ptolemy writes his book on astronomy, book one, that's actually a fairly thick chapter. These are all the assumptions you make. He lays less down the assumptions in front of you. If you look at Aryabhata, he doesn't lay down the assumptions at all. He lays down observations in front of you. You know, what are the periods that you observe and so on? What are the periods that I am going to assume? So there's big divergence in views. So there's a certain Greek way of doing things. And after the 19th century, uh, yeah, well, I think the West in general said, Okay, Bacon said all of this has nasty things about them, but really the Greeks had some great things because they really gave us science. There's something to it. And uh, you must admit that the Greeks were very clever about uh, this kind of proving method that they used. I'm not saying that they were not. So Feynman, when he asked about science, he said there are two ways of doing physics. One is the Greek method, axioms, first principles, and so on. The other one he called the Babylonian method. The Babylonian method is a bit like the Indian method that I'm talking about, except that Babylon as a civilization died long ago, but it was in India where these developments took place. But the Babylonian method was not like that. They observed. And uh, they did not make axioms and proofs. Uh, and Feynman said, I am a Babylonian, not a Greek. <laughs> well, that was a big statement to make uh, in uh, in uh, the West, and he said, I don't order nature to do things. I look at what nature does, and she tells me what I should do. I don't tell her what she should do, he said. So he took a very different view, and he actually loved computing. He was, uh, uh, he was good at computing. He must have read stories. Even before the digital era, Feynman was apparently an expert on those old electromechanical calculators, which is what he did when the atom bomb was being designed. And uh, late in his life, he was an expert on parallel computing, consulted for computing companies, asked the Japanese to make some computers, the Americans would not do it. I think he had a, he had a wider view, a bit like uh, what I was trying to say. But he said, I'm a Babylonian. What that picture showed was the argument with Dirac. They're both on the campus of Caltech. And uh, Feynman is trying to convince Dirac about something. Now, Dirac was actually a Greek. For him, he made one statement. It almost reminds me of Plato. He made a statement which said, you know, I don't care whether my equations 
agree with the experiment or not. <laughs> okay, just like that. What is important is whether they're beautiful. If they're beautiful, they probably turned out to be right. You see, it, it, was, it was a Greek view. So I showed that picture with Feynman on one side, the Babylonian or Indian view, if you want to put it that way, and Dirac on the other side, arguing on the campus of Caltech, not something. I just wanted to say there are at least two different views. Some, some Westerners agree that there are two. Professor, no, sorry. Well, what's the first? That's the, yeah, yeah, the give her the priority. Yeah. You might have partially answered my question. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about uh, Ayurveda and you know yes. uh, generally the emphasis on pratyaksha and anumana, yes. observation and inference. Yes. Now, in say as compared to Western medicine, where you have the modern yes. clinical trials and randomized sampling, yeah. do you think? I mean, how would you? Was it anywhere equivalent to that or uh, the approach? What was it? The Indian uh, approach. The Indian approach. Western medicine is being well, praised for, you know. I think the Indian uh, approach was uh, at least equivalent to it, and maybe perhaps better, <laughs> till the scientific revolution in Europe. Mm. But you see, you talked about, we talked about that uh, rhinoplasty, Nasa That's Sandharam. That was 1800. That was well after the scientific revolution started. Today there's a but contra controversy between Ayurveda and allopathy in Western medicine. Mm. And they say, uh, you know, it, it's not based on uh, any clinical uh, trials and uh, about trials Ayurveda, Ayurveda. Ayurveda. Whereas no, that's not true. Uh, okay, I have to make a distinction here between what the present Ayurvedic physician might tell you. See, I, uh, if you look, if you remember that table, I said Ayurveda lasted the creative period in Ayurveda ended around 800 AD. For the last thousand years, I don't think there were any big advances. The first 800 or 1000 years, from Susruta to Vagbhata, was a period when actually a lot of it was based on trials. In fact, uh, if you read Charaka, he is very clear. He says nothing should be accepted as a cure unless it has been debated with scholars. You have to give a seminar, you have to give a lecture and justify why you think this is a, this is a right treatment. How many people did you treat? What actually was your cure? Have other people tried it? So it was, uh, it was actually very rational. See, from one point of view, Indian science, till our dark ages, was, if anything, a little more rational than uh, the Greek and the European. Why? They were able to say, they were able to say, it doesn't matter what the scriptures say. And that was not said only by one group of scientists. It was common. It was common between Ayurveda, astronomy, mathematics, and so on. They all said the same thing. That's why I had the quote from Charaka and also from Nirakanta. It was one overall view. They don't talk about God. Bacon talks about God. These people don't talk about God when they're doing science. They may, as a side thing, do something about puja and worship and so on. And I think there it was basically a view which said, well, if somebody feels better by doing a certain kind of ritual, who am I to ask him not to do it? Unless there's some violence involved or something. But in their science, they rarely mention God. Yes. Um, wonderful talk. Uh, um, Thank you. Uh, Rodham. Uh, you know, the... Um, you know, one thing I found sort of quite interesting is that the scientific revolution also became extremely popular. People, people began to get involved in science uh, in Europe as never before. Yeah. And in the 14th centuries before that, yeah. how, I mean, how, how did, po popular was the notion of the world in, in the terms of the science that we understood it from in, in, India, the, in India? Yeah. Okay, now I think that, uh, <coughs> once again, my personal opinion, yeah, yeah. from uh, <coughs> what I've seen, I think this kind of science, you can call it high science if you want, I think it was largely, circul largely circulated among Sanskrit-knowing people. <coughs> uh, because that was the way that it was all India. See, these ideas, these people came from the very different places. They were from all over India, from Kerala, to Bihar, Kandahar, uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 
Bakshali, Peshawar. Right. You know, Takshasila there. Yeah, yeah. So they, 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 people came from many different parts of the country. And the only common medium they had was Sanskrit. And therefore, it sort of became the knowledge of a relatively privileged section. Brahmins, quite often. But not always. As you saw in Ayurveda, it was not strictly the property of the Brahmins. There were other castes also involved in it. If you go to your Vaidya, saying, uh, you know, you fix my nose, it was most unlikely to be a Brahmin. <laughs> Susruta himself was probably one, but uh, he did not make any distinction between these things. So, uh, but apart from that, I don't think it ever trickled down to the, uh, what you may call uh, the lay public. So, so, so I think that's why I'm, I'm wondering whether that led to, in some sense, the decline, uh, you know, in, in the 17th century. Uh, well, I think that might have been part of the reason, but it can't be the whole reason for the following uh, reason, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. Uh, the 16th century is when, when all of this happened. Uh, the Brahmins were not in a particularly disadvantageous position. Okay? And uh, they had these contacts. But quite often there were people who migrated from somewhere else. For example, the scholarly community in that little village, you know, Madhva and Co. They only come from a very small area there in Kerala. They are supposed to have slowly migrated from the north. It took several centuries to come down the west coast. <laughs> Maharashtra, the Nila, Nila River. Yeah. Huh? The Nila River. That's yeah. right, exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, there was an Indian view, there was an Indian community. Communication was slow, but it was uh, high science was among the uh, people, Sanskrit knowing people. The other side of science of their own, uh, there was, for example, the distinction between uh, Pauranics and uh, Siddhantics. The Siddhantics tended to be Brahmins, but the Pauranics not necessarily. Mythology had all kinds of stories. And uh, there were debates. The Pauranics did not agree with the Siddhantics. You know, all this kind of thought that uh, the, the high science people said were not popular with the other people. So they had arguments, but they were only arguments. <laughs> yeah. Sir? Sir? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so we had many mathematical uh, equations and theories like infinite series and roots of quadratic equations, etc. Yeah. So how much emphasis was given to proofs? To? Proofs. Proof. Pro proving theories. Well, there were algebraic demonstrations. See, the word proof has acquired a strong connotation of its own. Uh, I would say that uh, in general, if you talked about a proof, a mathematician will think you have some axioms, assumptions there, and this logic, and this logic leads to this conclusion. That is a proof. But uh, if you do something by computer, it may not be a proof. And, well, the objections have varied from how do you know that there's no error in your code? Maybe there's something with some transistor which is not working in the computer. I mean, these were the arguments used at first when this debate started. But slowly, I think uh, computing is playing a role which now cannot be easily replaced by analysis. Okay. So, the, the proof now is a, is a slightly loser concept. And anyway, as Godel showed, there are statements which are true, but you can't prove. So I think that things are, things are changing there. It's no longer what the Greeks thought it was. It will not disappear. There's something which you can do that way, something which you will not be able to do that way. Sir, yeah. uh, my question is uh, not on what you talked about today, but however it's uh, relevant to today's subject. So, uh, how did all the res uh, all those 3,000 or 4,000 results occur to Ramanujan, but he could not prove any of them? Yes. <laughs> Very good question, actually. <laughs> well, <clears throat> in fact, I would have said something about Ramanujan. and there was a slide there, but uh, there's no time. But it's a very relevant question. I think that Ramanujan uh, embodied the response of, uh, let's say, classical Indic mathematics to the onslaught of the new mathematics from the West. Okay, you know, he was uh, early 20th century. Well, as I said, the dark ages were up to the 19th century. In the 20th century, these new ideas began to come into India. And uh, more and more Indians 
began to study them. It's not an accident that uh, some of the finest scientists that India has produced came in that period, in the early 20th century. Now, Ramanujan was one who came from a very orthodox classical family, not wealthy, uh, but he had a certain, uh, he had not yet been converted, let's say, to modern science or modern mathematics. He didn't know about all those things, about proofs and uh, all the Greek things and so on. So his reaction was the reaction of a native genius. Now, he actually thought he had a method. And in fact, when he first started his correspondence with Hardy, he wrote him a letter saying, this is my method. So Hardy asked him, where is your proof? So uh, Ramanujan writes a letter, he says, this is my method. That letter has not been found yet. <laughs> OK. So we don't know exactly what he said to Hardy. However, his results, Hardy himself says, this result is known. This result has been proved. How do you know that this result is true? I've never seen it before. He classifies all of them. And Ramanujan complains to him a little bit, but you didn't answer my question about <laughs> my method. <coughs> that letter is there. But I think that, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> but I think that that was the big problem. Uh, that Ramanujan couldn't prove them the way that a mathematician in England would accept, a few mathematicians in England would accept. And I think they had arguments about it. And the cases where Ramanujan did something in collaboration with the other people, with Hardy himself and so on. But by and large, that was a problem. I think that um, Ramanujan, I don't know. You see, I, I think the country, India, will still not pass the Ramanujan test today. <laughs> what do you mean by that? You know, Ramanujan would not be admitted to any Indian university <laughs> because he had flunked his exams. He did very well in mathematics, but he flunked in English. He didn't even, he couldn't get admitted to a bachelor's degree. Right? But here he is, right, a great mathematician in England with all his results. And after a little correspondence, they say, you come here. In two years, he gets a bachelor's degree in Cambridge. Today, if he applies in any Indian university, he would not be admitted. You see, that is, that is the way that, uh, that the system here is. And they welcomed him, but they also had arguments about proof and so on. Well, another two, three years later, after he got his uh, bachelor's, he became a fellow of Trinity College. Another year, he would have been a fellow of the Royal Society. He was elected, but he came back and died. So he never signed his name in the register. Hi. Ah, sorry, it's better. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so in Europe, uh, post Bacon and Newton and uh, others, there was a very, there was also a enormous uh, interaction between the results these scientists and mathematicians were producing and technology, uh, military technology, farming yes, technology. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, <coughs> would you? Would you comment on <laughs> whether yeah. post Nilakanta, who uh. comes from the Kerala school, uh, the, these dark ages that you mentioned of yeah. Indian uh. science and mathematics have something to do with the fact that uh, this knowledge was not translated into yes, yes. practical things yeah. about life? Well, I, I, I do think so. And I think that um, that can be partly attributed to the caste system. See, the caste system in India divided up knowledge among the different communities. In fact, uh, you know, we talked about intellectual property. India was more fussy about intellectual property based on community and caste. And we are now with uh, patent rights and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you have the, pay by the money you have to pay in order to buy a technology or something. So the interaction between these different the technology community and the science community was very weak. I think it was not entirely absent. If you look at our buildings, architecture, I think there was some interaction. Well, because uh, you know, the Brahmins said how a temple should be built. They made the rules. But uh, it was, they, they did not build those temples. And the people who built those temples were very skillful in translating those ideas into 
into buildings, which uh, many of which have lasted for centuries, even longer. But I do think that the caste system had, was definitely a culprit there. And I don't know whether we've still completely gotten rid of it, but I, I do think that it's uh, disappearing slowly. But um, in its heyday, science and technology were different things. Uh, the Brahmins didn't mind doing, I mean, you mentioned chemistry. <laughs> they didn't mind making experiments in chemistry. Okay. And in fact, one of those, uh, one of those uh, uh, well-known Sanskrit works, I think it's called the Rasarnama, it says, everything I described to you in this book is done by me. So you can assume that this is exactly what will happen. I'm not quoting somebody else. I've made these experiments myself. So there was experimental chemistry I among mean, these people. But I don't see much in uh, physics. In fact, uh, physics in the sense that it's used now, there was, I think, uh, very little in India. It was, uh, whatever was there was in astronomy. And the interesting thing even there is that in astronomy, they sometimes draw inferences, which are actually, you know, which done in Europe, would have been advertised as big discoveries of new principles. If you read Aryabhata, these things are on the side. He is interested in making algorithms which will predict what happens. He will say on the side, you know, from the eclipses, he will say this is nothing to do with Rahu and Ketu, it's the shadow of the moon on the sun's surface, for example, of the earth, for example, on the moon. So it shows that the earth is wrong, but he doesn't advertise that conclusion. It's just on a piece of one some shloka somewhere, shows that the earth is wrong. <laughs> And the source, this is a matter of shadows, not Rahu and Ketu. He, he does that sort of thing. He's also, so, if you ask him, is the system geocentric or uh, heliocentric? His answer would be, you know, as far as my calculations are concerned, it doesn't matter. It depends only on the relative velocity. But he does it to the state that has a big principle. He says, just as you see if you're sailing down a river on a boat, for you, on the boat, the trees seem to be moving in the opposite direction. It's the same thing with the sun and the planet. <laughs> so, the, the ideas were there, but they were not seen as general principles. They were secondary, not primary. Primary thing, that's why I called it computational positivism. You may make the principle and it may even be right, but if you couldn't get a computational procedure to predict it, well, that was not useful. What do I do with it? <laughs> So, I think that was their attitude. So that is that the attitude I infer from what they say. A lot of hands went up and we've run out of time. So I request everybody to catch the speaker over <laughs> coffee. Uh, the last question. Yes. So Sorry. my question is, uh, if the Dark Ages pretty much set in around the 17th century, but you said Ayurveda stopped growing after the 8th century. Do we know why? Do we know why it stopped yeah. and why it didn't grow yeah, along yeah. with the rest till the 17th? Yeah. Well, I do think that, uh, <coughs> you know, there are times which are uh, appropriate where there are some really advantageous conditions for something to develop. For example, let me answer it for mathematics. If you say, when did the mathematical revolution occur in India? It occurred around the first few centuries after Christ, okay, third or fourth century, because that's when people began to make these new, new numeral systems. That turned out to be so powerful that it became very easy to achieve progress, so to speak. It was such a powerful invention that to make calculations became easier, as you showed in that picture, as I showed in the picture. And therefore, all these things, you know, came one after the other very fast, very fast according to that time scale. I mean, it took centuries, but it, uh, it really, happened there. You run out of ideas. You have sort of exploited it to the limit. And if there is no new idea, then that, that field, as practiced in that country or civilization, will die. The great thing that happened in Europe, however, was that because they made a mix, still with some Greek ideas, some Indian ideas, some Chinese ideas, and so on, I think it has proved robust over the last uh, several centuries. Well, Ayurveda was robust for about uh, 1,000 years at least. I don't think uh, there were new ideas. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Let's thank Professor Nasima for a very <laughs>